York City was in transition in 2002. The devastation of 9-11 still lingered, but a new sense of goodwill and compassion flowed through the city with dozens of bands reanimating a faded glory that had come to define the Giuliani era. Arriving after several well-regarded EPs that honed Interpol's sonic and sartorial sense, it's possible no album captured this moment as vividly as their debut, Turn On The Bright Lights. Interpol took shape at NYU in the late 1990s, where the band formed partially as a result of mutual fashion appreciation. Frontman Paul Banks had come across bassist Carlos Dengler in their dorm, wearing skin-tight black clothing and a giant crucifix. Meanwhile, guitarist Daniel Kessler had already gotten to know Dengler in a World War I class after approaching him with a compliment about his shoes, and the trio eventually found replacement drummer Sam Fogarino while he was working in a used clothing store. Soon after coming together, the group started to jam at Funkadelic Studios. PDA was already in embryonic form by then. After hustling in the NYC circuit and recording here and there, a chance meeting with Emma Pollock of the Delgados led to the release of an Interpol EP in 2000 on the esteemed Chemical Underground label. On the heels of the EP's success, and in the midst of the post-strokes gold rush in New York City, Interpol scored a deal with Matador Records, then home to bands like Bell and Sebastian, Yola Tango, and Pavement. Chris Lombardi of Matador claimed that he was most impressed by the business-like manner with which the band conducted themselves, the suits first and foremost. Interpol decided to record Turn On The Bright Lights at producer Peter Cadis' home studio in Bridgeport, Connecticut, to avoid all of the temptations New York City had to offer a hot young band. While Cadis has gone on to produce The National, Frightened Rabbit, and Yancey, his most recent credit prior to Turn On The Bright Lights was engineering the Get Up Kids on a wire. Sessions were contentious. Carlos D. had wanted more keyboards, more nights on the town, and the title of the record to be Celebrated Bass Lines of the Future. If Banks had his way, PDA wouldn't have even made the record. However, Cadis protested and told him, that's your hit single, which it was. Cadis was not enthused with the new until the final mix, which had him in tears. But for all the seriousness and grandeur of Turn On The Bright Lights, moments of humor abounded. The spoken intro of Stella was a diver and she was always down was recorded while Banks was ad-libbing with ice in his mouth. This one's called Stella was a diver and she's always down. Anchored by Carlos D. and Fogarino's hulking rhythm section, Banks created a New York City recognizable to its citizens, but in cryptic, indelible lyrics. The subway was a porno, Relationships were a bracelet, and they had 200 couches for you to sleep when it all felt like too much. Beginning with a crowd-stoking instrumental that would foreshadow runs opening for U2 and The Cure, Turn on the Bright Lights resulted in music of unusually sweeping and grandiose gestures that felt foreign to rock music in general at the time, but especially to indie rock. It's hard to imagine the transition towards the post-punk bombast of Arcade Fire, The Killers, and The National without Interpol opening the lane first. While local papers would occasionally snark at them as fashion victims and post-punk dilettantes, critical acclaim for Turn On The Bright Lights was overwhelmingly positive. The brilliance of Turn On The Bright Lights is all the more apparent 15 years later, a beacon that continues to shine radiantly during its city's darkest moments. Turn on the-